So what I want to talk about is the Dutch Revolution and uh, primitive accumulation by capitalist colonialism. Uh, this is just a short little piece uh, that I want to get done. I think I just have a few minutes here, but I'm going to try to squeeze this in. And the Dutch Revolution. So back in the Never Netherlands, um, uh, so just about 10 years after Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, just about 10 years after he dies, the 80 year war uh, breaks out. So the 80 years war, um, also known as the Dutch War of Independence, uh, because it's a major factor, but it brings in a lot of, a lot of players on the continent. Um, uh, this war breaks out and it, and it lasts for 80 years. And, and so this war is not gonna wrap up until 1648 which is just about the time that the English Revolution uh, is getting underway. And at the end of this 80 years, um, but it gets underway in six, uh, 1568. We have the Un Union of Utrecht, um, and that's an alliance uh, of States of Netherlands against Philip II. That's the son of Charles V, who is the King of Spain and and the King of the seventeen states of Netherlands. Um, and this is an alliance against Philip in 1579. And by 1588, now seven of the provinces or states within the Netherlands have created a union and declared themselves independent from the kingdom of Philip. And so now the Netherlands is split between the mostly northern portion of the Netherlands, which is this union of U Utrecht, um, the United Netherlands, and then the southern portion that is closer or, or even going into what is sometimes considered France, even during this period, is the Spanish Netherlands that is still controlled uh, by Philip. And this is the situation that persists throughout most of the story, most of the period uh, that I'm going to discuss in this series of lectures. So that's kind of the, the standing situation is you have these northern Netherlands states that are unified, independent of Philip, and then you have the southern portion of the Netherlands that is uh, called the Spanish Netherlands. Okay. <clears throat> and then I also just wanted to cover this real quickly is we have, uh, remember that I mentioned before in Marx's Capital, Volume One. There's a there's a chapter on primitive accumulation, and in, in one of the justifications uh, for capitalist uh, production and the way that capitalists exploit the labor of uh, wage earners is that well the capitalist has the money, the wealth, and therefore they get to dictate. The conditions of production, and they can take the profits for themselves, and you know make the workers live on starvation wages, um, because they had it in the first place. And the question is, well, how did you get it in the first place? And some of that schematic, you know, um, uh, description that I gave of different phases of production goes some way to undermining this notion of primitive accumulation. Uh, but then, you know, we have these glaring examples of like the Spanish empire exploiting the labor uh, of, of, of uh, Native American peasants, uh, indigenous people, 
of the campesinos and um, and you know just driving them into slavery conditions and of course there's the African slave trade where this labor is being used to accumulate vast amounts of wealth uh, just stealing the labor value from from people outright um, without even dressing it up in some kind of feudal structure. And then you have uh, at this period of time, as we move into the 17th century, the 1600s, you have the first joint stock companies. And so this is like the beginning of the stock market. So this is the first, um, uh, maybe not the, the absolute first, but the the first big splash of something that looks like a stock market where you can buy shares, you know, if you're relatively wealthy in the East Indian Company um, or the Dutch East Indian Company. So the East Indian Company is the British or, or English East Indian Company uh, founded in London. <clears throat> and then uh, similarly, we have the Dutch East Indian Company. These both were, uh, colonizing uh, operations, but they are businesses for profit. And you can buy a share in the company. And lots of people did. And so you have these companies running strictly for profit, but the way that they accumulate profit and give it to their shareholders in the form of dividends and increased value of their shares is that they systematically appropriate the labor of indigenous peoples. Um, the English East Indian Company did that very significantly in India. That became their prime target and their most successful operation. Uh, the Dutch India, East Indian Company uh, is working in Indonesia and um, and uh, Southeast Asia on the mainland, and um, and beginning to actually accumulate uh, quite vast uh, sums of money. And a, a sort of side phenomenon that grows out of this is the tulip mania in uh, Holland. And Holland is, is a province within, within the Netherlands, uh, but it is like the, the central part. Um, but especially in Holland, they're known for their love of tulips. And this goes all the way back to this time period where people are growing their own tulips and um, it's a kind of status symbol and a way of decorating your home, not only on the inside, but on the outside, like in your garden. And uh, just, you know, it's a, an aesthetic thing, but a cultural thing, you know, it's, uh, which is, seems all good and fine and, and wonderful in, in many ways. Um, but what happened in 1634, is people began to trade uh, what people start to do is they start to trade uh, tulips as like as futures and futures markets hadn't even um, been well established at this point. Uh, you know, really, the these East Indian companies are the beginning of stock markets, and and so what the tulip mania begins to develop is what we would consider a futures market today, where people would would promise to purchase tulips in the future at today's prices assuming that when it was uh, when it was time to buy the tulips they could buy them uh, when the, or when they were to be delivered is in the future they bought them at today's prices assuming that they're going to be worth more in the future 
and then they buy them on that day, but they immediately turn around and sell them. So they don't even really take possession of them. They just take possession of them on paper and then sell them off quickly at a higher price. And then they make the difference in the price. Um, and that it works all good and fine as long as the price is going up. But as soon as the price plateaus, everyone who's holding futures starts to panic and they start short selling, you know, selling at a loss, but not what they anticipate is going to be a loss. And it's a self feeding sort of downward spiral so that uh, it causes a crash, like a deep crash. This is like a, a, a cryptocurrency today because it works like this. And we've seen some pretty dramatic crashes. The tulip mania kind of just went and went for two, two and a half years. And then with, within three to six months, it totally crashed and, and, and fell apart. <clears throat> and part of that's just in the inherent nature of, of uh, markets of this sort. But, um, uh, but there is uh, some explanation that there was some kind of uh, virus that was infecting the tulips. And the most valuable ones were these striped tulips that began to be very popular and gained a higher price, but they were actually infected with a virus that was making their lifespan smaller or maybe destroying the productivity of new generations of them. I'm not quite sure, uh, but uh, nonetheless, this is like the first big financial bu bubble uh, of financialization. So, so that's kind of interesting. Way back at the beginning of the 17th century. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop that here and I will see you in the next video.